think that uh, Gretchen, I think you had something you wanted to add also with this uh, on the with the Zeno brothers as well. Did you not? Thank you. Uh, firstly, Andrea, uh, the book is fantastic. I've got a copy. Uh, it's on Amazon.com, and it is uh, last I checked, it's it's very available. I have always been a proponent of looking at the spaces in between history modules. It's um, hu human history rolls like like and falls like dominoes. It doesn't cease at 1066, the last great Viking raid, when William the Conqueror took the throne of England. It, there's follow through with all of these people and connections. I did want to help knit uh, what, what Andrea has, has written about with Gudrid's people who help frame in broad terms, how that would look. So I'm not sure if right now is an appropriate time to do that, or um, shall I keep shall I keep waffling, Jeff? <laughs> no, if you want to, if you want to go down there, please. You know, okay. Time frame well, is really interesting. She uh, approximately was active in in 1020, give or take. And 100 years later, you have the formation of the Knights Templar in 1119, which is how the accepted date in the in Western Europe, etc. So that's only four generations. It's only a hundred years. Prior to that, you also have to understand that the Vikings, Gudrid's people, were sailing as far into Istanbul. They became the honor guard of the emperor in Istanbul, had been Constantinople, and there's a, a railing where, you know, these mercenary honor guards protecting the, the emperor at uh, church. And basically it's kind of like Sven was here because he was bored, you know, through, through this service. They traveled far and wide all the way across Europe and deep inland along all the river arteries, the seas, those were the highways. That's, that's how things got done. Land was dangerous, it was difficult, you could be robbed, uh, and it was safer on the water. So Rollo, of course, um, is one of these Viking chieftains who actually terrorizes and raids the city of Paris. And to prevent him from doing so again, basically negotiations went underway. The king of Paris married his daughter to Rollo and made him a duke and gave the Norsemen Normandy to guard the mouth of the river Seine from his uh, countrymen, basically his, his tribe, other Vikings. So that's how we ended up with, with Rollo becoming royalized and all that technology, all that information, all that, you know, warrior culture went right into the French crown. Fast forward, we've got, we've got Gudrid, who's a noble woman. Very interesting individual. I would say she definitely has what I would call a scholar's heart in that she's not out there killing people, raiding and pillaging, etc. But she is of her people. She is a diplomat. She wants to find out, trade, and embrace other peoples. The Scandinavian countries are harsh. The uh, peoples there had to find other places to live but they took their technology with them. So what I'm trying to build a case is for the Vikings all the way into the heartland and, and nobility and royalty of the French royal family. We have also many of the original Knights Templar from uh, the north part of Germany that is, it's due east from Denmark and uh, right on the coastline. Believe it or not, a place I've just uh, just found spelled Graal, G-R-A-A-L. So you've got an original Templar with that DNA, you know, right next to these Scandinavian waters. And all of that technology goes right into the Templar Knights. Just briefly, show how technology can be passed down. A piece of Icelandic uh, spar quartz Optical calcite was found on a sunken Elizabethan ship off the coast of France not too long ago. 
And until then, and this is found in a navigation box of the captain's uh, navigation uh, equipment. So you've got this uh, optical calcite that was used by the Vikings called a sunstone. And it was written down with such prowess, mystic, mysticism, spirituality, that academics actually didn't believe that it was a real object because it had such magical powers, but it allows you to see the sun on a cloudy day. So you are not going to get lost. That's an Elizabethan warship that this object was found on in recent years. So there's a direct line of secret information that goes all the way down. And one of the main resources in North America is of course, right, right by Gold Island is Gold River. Uh, where they panned for gold, but also uh, timber. Game was plentiful. By the time uh, 600 AD rolled around, the French, the kingdoms, had, had obliterated their bears. So there you have in North America rich resources that could be brought over. There was no competition by other Europeans for these resources. So yes, the, the, I believe the Templars inherited uh, the technology, the navigation capacity, the direct information went right into the original top brass of, of, of their order. So I hope that that brief overview can help you see the progression from Gudrid's time, and she was amongst one of the original travelers there. And of course, she would have talked about it. All of these individuals who went on these journeys spoke about it and passed that down. So I hope that you can see that transmission from 1020 to uh, 1120 when the Templars were formalized. So. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And I did want to mention also, I see that you have your books behind you. Um, you have written quite a few books as, um, you know, and Andrea has as well. <laughs>